Hey folks, this is the Yaku Cosmopolitan. Pool A and Pool B, respectively, have finished all their games in the 2023 World Baseball Classic, so now it's time for the quarterfinals in Tokyo. I went to every single game in Pool B, except for the last one between China and Korea, because it was a meaningless game. But I really had an amazing time, and I'll be there once again tomorrow for the quarterfinal. Now, in a perfect world, I would have been able to make a recap video for all these games every single day but unfortunately it just wasn't possible for me because I was at Tokyo Dome from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. for basically five days straight and I was getting home way past midnight so I just didn't have the time to record and edit videos unfortunately but I'll definitely do some more WBC content in the coming weeks but for now the more pressing matter at hand are the quarterfinal matchups which will be between Cuba versus Australia and Japan versus Italy. So let's briefly preview these matchups beginning with Cuba, Australia. Pool A in uh, Taiwan was absolute chaos as all five teams finished at two and two. They all had the same record. Almost seems impossible with, um, you know, just the odds of that, but with how evenly matched those teams were, it certainly makes sense. And Cuba were the lucky ones that came out on top thanks to the tiebreaker rules favoring their low runs against total. So despite a disappointing 0-2 start to their tournament, they have the best case scenario here, advancing as the pool winner and dodging Japan. Now, their probable starter for this, for this quarterfinal should be Yariel Rodriguez, who pitched in the opening game against the Netherlands and, and did very well, tossing four innings of one run ball. I was super hyped about seeing his baseball savant stat cast data for the first time. I always knew that slider of his was elite, but it was touching 3,000 RPMs, so it's clearly one of the best pitches in the tournament, even better than a lot of the top MLB pitchers. And he's now on full rest, so he can uh, go the full 80 pitches because the, tar the pitch limit increases from 65 to 80 in this round of the tournament. Uh, Rodriguez is a reliever on the Chunichi Dragons, so he is obviously used to pitching in Japan and on you know the mound of the Tokyo Dome which I think gives him an inherent advantage and if he has a solid 80 pitch outing to get through five innings allowing like one or two runs then Cuba is going to be in a territory where they can call on Rodriguez's teammate Rydal Martinez as well as SoftBank Hawk setup man Levon Moinello to cover the final two or three innings so that would be you know a perfect game plan for them if all goes well those guys are elite uh, obviously, some people say it might be better to save Rodriguez until the semifinals, but honestly, if you're Cuba, getting to Miami is already a huge success, so I think you need to put all hands on deck to ensure you beat uh, the Aussies. Uh, they're much better. You know, Cuba's much better than Australia on paper, but the Aussies did upset Korea, so you can't treat them lightly at all. Uh, the Aussies were just bullpenning in almost every game, so I don't know who's going to start against Cuba, but whether it's Saupold or Glagowski or someone else, uh, I don't expect them to work very deep. Part of Australia's success came from just throwing a whole bunch of different arms at their opponents, so I expect them to do that again here and try to use a, a bunch of different guys like Wynn and Van Steenzel and Kent and Holland, uh, who all looked pretty all right during, during pool play. The Australian pitchers don't exactly have the best command, so you're going to see your fair share of walks, but they have a couple of arms that can run it up to the low to mid 90s, so it isn't the worst staff overall, but I wouldn't say it's their strength either. Their strength definitely comes from the, the offense, especially the power in that top three. Tim Kennelly, uh, Alex Hall, and Robbie Glendening, they all displayed a lot of pop. They can definitely mash, so Rodriguez and Cuba will have their hands full for sure. But even if the Aussies end up putting some runs on the board, I think they're going to have a tough time containing that Cuban offense that finally got hot. Uh, in their final two games. Obviously, there's the big MLB names and Luis Robert and Yoan Mancada, but there's also MPB guys like Alfredo Despaine and Ariel Martinez and Yerisbo Graciel, uh, as well as some Cuban National Series stars. So it's a very deep offense in many ways, and I don't think Australia have the necessary pitchers to keep them at bay for nine innings, um, meaning as long as Cuba has a decent day on both sides of the ball, doesn't have to be great, just make sure you're not allowing too many free passes, to avoid you know a potential three-run bomb uh and you know if they put up like five runs themselves they should be booking their tickets to miami australia has done an excellent job to get this far i would be shocked if they pulled off an upset against a powerhouse like cuba though 
uh, especially now that Cuba has been given a second life of sorts thanks to that absurd pool A uh, with everyone finishing two and two. I just don't see Cuba squandering that and I'm excited to see how their current and former MPV players perform, perform for this game. As for Samurai Japan, avoiding the Netherlands and Cuba both is a big plus in my opinion because even though Japan has always done well against those teams in the past, they're still much better than Team Italy on paper. Uh, I think Italy are a legit team full of, you know, Italian Americans with major league and minor league experience, but they have no business beating Japan, especially with Shohei Otani taking the mound. Uh, he was masterful in his opening game against China, picking up 5Ks and allowing just one hit through four uh, while maintaining his pitch count very effectively. He'll be on a full week, uh, full week of rest, and obviously he isn't in mid-season form yet, um, but he should be able to go four or five innings now. Uh, in which case, the only question for Japan is who comes in next. They planned out their followers very effectively during pull play, so Shosei Togo came in right after Otani, Shota Imanaga came in right after Yu Darvish, Hiroya Miyagi came in right after Roki Sasaki, and Keiji Takahashi followed Yoshinobu Yamamoto. That's exactly how they wanted to do it, because these guys are traditional starters in MPB, so it's essentially kind of mimicking a standard like regular season game where the starter is going six or seven, except you're using two different starters to get to that same point. Uh, and then Japan has a whole bunch of high leverage elite relievers at their disposal. Granted, their projected closer, Roji Kuribayashi, has been removed from the roster with an injury and replaced by Soichiro Yamazaki, who's also very good. But um, with Yuki Udagawa, Taisei, Atsuki Yuasa, and Hiromi Ito, who've all been in very, very good form, Japan has almost an infinite different combinations for how to navigate this Italian lineup, which consists of, uh, you know, some major, legit major leaguers like Nicky Lopez, David Fletcher, and Vinny Pasquantino, uh, and some up-and-coming prospects like Sal Frelick. So it's a better lineup than, than, you know, say Australia or Czech Republic that they face, but I don't think it's on the level of, of Korea, uh, and Japan did pretty well against Korea. Um, now, if it were up to me, I'd probably want Otani and the follower to just take me through six or seven. So you can go Otani for four or five, depending on pitch count, and then maybe Shosei Togo or Shota Imanaga for two or three. And it's even possible that Yu Darvish comes in after Otani. Uh, he wasn't that great against Korea, but, you know, if they really need him, he's a good veteran. Um, but it probably should be Imanaga because Italy is pretty left-hand heavy. Um, but... You know, regardless, uh, manager Hideki Kuriyama is going to need to be very proactive uh, because this is a quarterfinals game and one loss will end their entire tournament. So the first sign that somebody doesn't have it that day should result in a pull for me. Uh, but I do think Kuriyama is willing to give these guys a bit of a leash since they're all pretty reliable. And as long as you have Udagawa ready, ready to come in uh, in any bad situation and they have Taisei, Yuasa, Ito, and even like Hiroto Takahashi... For the late innings, I don't think Italy can do that much damage. Japan absolutely dominated on the mound during pull play with a 1.50 ERA and a 54 to 4 strikeout to walk ratio. So yeah, they've been in great form. And that's, you know, pitching is the backbone of this Japanese team. Now the offense has also been great with a team OPS hovering around 1000, but it could be even better. Minitaka Murakami is still in a massive slump and they missed some key opportunities in a couple of big spots there in the first round. I can't count how many times they stranded the bases loaded. Um, but their top three, Lars Nupar, Kensuke Kondo, and Otani, are all hitting well over 400 combined, uh, and they've gotten plenty of clutch hits from the likes of Shugo Maki and Tetsuto Yamada too. But I do think the MVP of their offense has to be Macho Man Masutaka Yoshida in the 5-hole, batting around 600 with 8 RBIs, just always coming in, coming up big in the clutch spots. He's been kind of the glue that's kept this offense running, even when Murakami falters in, in that cleanup spot. Uh, now, Sosuke Genda fractured his pinky in the second game, so they've been going with Hakumi Nakano at shortstop, who is not nearly as defensively sound, but he's okay. Uh, and he's done pretty well with the bat, plus he can activate the running game, much like Genda, so... It isn't, it isn't the biggest loss um, since the you know Nakano and Genda are pretty similar players, but when all is said and done, I think the starting line of Japan rolls out against Italy will be number one, Lars Nubar center field, two, Kensuke Kondo in right, three, Otani at DH, four, I think they should go with Masataka Yoshida, put him in the cleanup spot, but I would not be surprised if Munitaka Murakami stays there since Kuriyama has shown his trust in his third baseman. 
um, five Kazuma Okamoto at first, and then again I would go I would go six Murakami at third, seven Shugo Maki at second. It's be it's between him or Yamada, but Maki has two homers this tournament, so I'd go with him. Eight shortstop Nakano, and then nine catcher uh, Yuhei Nakamura. He's just been so much better than Kai overall, uh, and he had three big hits in the final game. So that's a lineup I feel pretty good about. Um, and even though they weren't really tested in pool place, and so many of the Czech and Chinese pitchers were throwing so slow that the hitters just had to try to adjust to these ultra off-speed pitches, um, I don't think they even saw a single pitch above 94 miles per hour in pool play. Uh, Italy will probably just throw their entire bullpen at Japan, but, you know, Ryan Castellani, Andre Palanti, and Matteo Bacci are some of the more prominent names they should be prepared for. No Matt Harvey, since he threw games 1 and 4 for Italy already. So Japan will be going up against some professional pitchers, uh, many of which are in MLB orgs, but they're nothing too crazy. Japan will be able to hit these guys 9 days out of 10. They just need to make sure they don't have that one bad day. And again, with their pitching, Japan has been excellent at limiting the walks. So you, if you force Italy to earn bases and you're careful not to give up you know, a blast to South Frelick or Vinny P., I expect the Samurai to be on their way to Miami. At least, you know, I'm manifesting that. But anyway, that's all I really wanted to talk about for now. Really looking forward to these quarterfinal games. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe for more MPB and WBC content in English.